Hello, gang. <laughs> There's the music. It must be Wednesday morning. Nice. Get her a little. Oh, nice. <laughs> All the way to England. Excellent. Excellent. Ah. Uh, how is everybody in the chat this morning? A lot of action going on already with the weather reports, which, you know what? I love that. I love hearing what, uh, what other people are enduring. Um, there's something with being Canadian, which really makes us like either proud or whiny or both about weather. So, you know, it's a, it's a point of cultural pride with us. So. You have an appreciation of other people's pain. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're very empathetic um, because even even though we don't ever get a, well, I shouldn't say we don't, we did last week in some spots in Canada, but no, even though we don't hit 115s or 120s or whatever, we can imagine that very easily in a sense that, you know, for us getting to 100 is extremely hot. And so we can endure or we can empathize very well because of that. So um, my goodness, where's Brent? <sighs> He's on vacation this week, guys. Um, and in Brent's chair, no, not in Brent's chair, in his own chair, but taking Thank up you. Brent's taking up Brent's video square this week is my fellow Domino colleague, Dr. Paul Schneider. Paul, this is your first time joining us. So uh, introduce yourself to the folks. Hey, thanks for having me. Well, I have joined once or twice uh, in the audience, but uh, not in the chair. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I uh, just a little bit uh, quickly about myself. I come back and uh, into instructional design. Actually, uh, walked into it during my doctorate degree uh, when I was uh, studying counseling psychology and in the education department. And there's all these smart education folks out there that I started <laughs> hanging out with, and this weird thing called the web that was starting to emerge. And well, as they say, the rest uh, ended up being history. So glad <laughs> to be here today and uh, really excited to hear more about accessibility. That's been something uh, a little bit of uh, one of my passions uh, that I love to hear about. And I had the pleasure of meeting Susie last year and uh, learning a bit more about her venture and uh, really launching a much needed book here. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of which, joining <laughs> us as well this week is... Susie Miller, who is the author of, and you're going to hold the book up and you're going to tell us the title. It's just Designing Accessible Learning Content. Brilliant. And um, show us the side of that book because I've heard it. Yeah, there we go. It's substantial. It's not just a PDF, folks. Oh, and look, Paul's got a copy too. Yeah. Um, Susie, introduce yourself to our to our folks, uh, a little bit of your, your background, etc. Yeah, so I've been an instructional guy as I met. Oh, I've got a bit of um, echo on my hmm. uh, headphones here. Anything okay. I can do to stop that? Hmm. Um, I'm not certain because we're. I'm not hearing it. Paul, you're hearing Fortunately, it? we're not hearing it. It's just no. going to be annoying for you. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> okay, so I've been instructional designer for about 10 years, and I started, sorry, really mm -hmm. trying to get, Being an instructional okay. designer means you deal with technical problems. Yeah, that sounds a bit better. Okay, so I have been an instructional designer. <laughs> I really can't do. I'm so sorry. No worries. Um, Can I take the headphones out? Yeah, well, let's give that a try. The, the, the echo may become something for all of us, but yeah. Ooh. Susie, I've just temporarily muted your microphone there just to get that. Okay. Try again. Do you um do you hear us okay now? I can hear you okay, yeah. Yeah. And are you, you sound great? Yeah, I you, sound you, great. Good. You've I been can great hear from our side. Well. Okay. You've been great from our side the whole time. So although okay. you know, it's those it's like gonna be in, in your own, own thoughts. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Very so, good. Yes. So sorry, catastrophic <laughs> technical problems today. Uh, yes. So I have been an instructional line designer for about 10 years. And I started off in the public sector. And I have also done a lot of training in the past. And 
Um, I moved into instructional design um, basically because that was the way the, the department was going. And when I started in my instructional design, I um, was always really interested in accessible, accessibility. And um, so that's why I ended up writing up the book. Hmm. Awesome. Um, and how's the echo for you now? Is it uh, still it bad? Out? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, um, as Jennifer says uh, in the chat, you, you do sound great twice. <laughs> <laughs> the trouble is, I can't concentrate on what I'm saying. I hear, I, well, I hear you, but not the echo. Um, I, I definitely feel for you. Um, what if you um, maybe put the headphones not right over your ears? Okay. Um, just you know a little bit less of, of hearing yourself maybe um or just around your neck maybe or something um i don't know i mean you'll still you'll still hear an echo but maybe you'll hear less of it and there'll be less of an intrusion maybe okay yeah that's uh, as, as long as you can still hear us enough to to hear what I we're can. saying so fantastic yeah. that's much better yeah. you still I sound great yeah <laughs> please do <Really>. awesome <laughs> cool oh, um you know i was thinking about um but we've done lots of stuff around accessibility. It's been a topic that Paul's been focused on, um, you know, here at Domino for a while. Um, and but it's it's always been very meaningful and important to us. And one of the neat things, I, I I'm using the word neat, uh, but when, when when we were first doing this thing, and Paul and I we've been doing this for a long time. We yes. Were, you know, <laughs> but it, the only time that accessibility came up really was when we were talking to a government organization. Um, and it felt like, you know, a decade ago or so that the rest of the world, it wasn't something that that was a focus in, in say, in conversations. The um, but the last four or five years, uh, it, it really has become much more important to to so many more organizations. Um, and it sort of feels like people are finally starting to, you know, get it that it's important um, and that it's it's a critical thing, um, you know, to provide. Um, Let's maybe talk a little bit about why that why it is so important to be able to make sure that you know say content and, and other uh, other things are accessible. So for me, I think the the idea that well, the whole of what we're in, involved in and what we're doing is trying to make the learners engaged, and it's just seems in, in, inconceivable really to me that we're doing that and not making sure that all of our audience is engaged. So although there's lots of different um you know ideas about um the, the statistics involved i think it's fairly safe to say between about 12 and 26 percent of the population um, have a disability so for me it just doesn't make sense to be creating learning um that isn't accessible for everyone because automatically from the beginning we're we're just you know excluding people and you know that there, there is no reason to do that so i think for me that's that's sort of the starting point of what we need to be aware of when we're talking about accessibility. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about as uh, ahead of the, you know, our, our session today, even, and um, I mean, what we even think of as um, a disability isn't um, it, it's uh, we might have a couple of things in mind. We picture the wheelchair symbol, you know, for instance, or we feel we, we see, but there are so many of us who, who have something. I mean, uh, I have, um, I have a need for these things now I've, I've reached the age where i so can't many people you know so so uh, i wouldn't consider myself in in a you know big sense you know having a disability but it is a thing that i've that i have to be aware of and so reading things on the screen etc um you know is always a thing i gotta either have the reading glasses or i gotta be able to bump the fonts way way bigger um i have a a, a small knee problem which um i'm a relatively you know healthy person, but sometimes I look at something and go, yeah, my knee's not going to be happy if I'm going to go up that incline, for example. So um, it's, it's not just about, um, say, the most obvious um, or, or the, I don't know what the term is, the better term maybe than more obvious, but um, it, it just, it, it runs through so many lives uh, that we don't really think about. We think about those, you know, the, the, the parking stickers and, and, and those sorts of things per se. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think too, there's so many 
what they call hidden disabilities we don't see as often. But even that, uh, just the things that you do, certain things you may do, you just don't run across people. Just like uh, if you live in certain areas, you don't run across certain cultures um, and and hang out. So you used to think, oh, there isn't, you hear that number and it's like, wow, that can't be true because I don't know anybody <laughs> um, mm -hmm. that has that. And, and the reality is I think sometimes there are several people that you do know. Um, you just didn't even know that they uh, might have a challenge with a particular way things are presented or particular types of situations. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the same um, in my case. Um, not realizing, for example, that I, I was dyslexic until I was quite a lot older. There's a lot of people, I think, possibly, you know, our generation who, you know, aren't even aware necessarily that they that they have what I call, you know, a neurodiversity that would would make it, you know, some certain types of learning more difficult for them. And for me, I have to say, discovering later on that, that you know, that that is the way my brain works was just a revelation for me thinking I've always thought, well, you know, what is it? Why is it that I can't understand that and everybody else can? So I think that there's that idea. And also, I think as well as when we're talking about disability impairment, we can also be thinking about temporary and situational impairments as well. So not necessarily a disability, but, you know, the things that we can do to our learning to, to which um, help people who have a disability actually help all of our learners. So, you know, it's very clear things like captions and transcripts, etc., really help people depending on which what situation they're in and also you know how they prefer to learn as well so for me it's just a it's it's a no-brainer really it's a real win-win to make things accessible mm -hmm. yeah i'm thinking of the um i'm going to call it a cartoon but the um because i've only seen it done as a visual illustration but the uh, you know, you could build the stairs and then add a ramp on, or you could simply build a ramp to the front of the building and everybody mm -hmm. can take advantage of it. Um, and there's not a not a, a separation of those and solving a multitude of problems with, with one, you know, one simpler solution. Um, one of the other things I think about, you were mentioning how people prefer, uh, a lot of the things that we can do to help people have content be more accessible are also just practical things for the real world. Um, I an awful, awful lot of folks just watch uh, you know, TV shows now with the, the subtitles on. Um, mm -hmm. There's lots going on in the room. We've got a, you know, you've got a, probably got a device in your hand too and the dog's chewing in the corner and, uh, you, know, you know, so I, I know a lot of people who even just take advantage of that just to be able to, um, you know, follow period in a, in a very distracted world. So um, it, it extends certainly beyond uh, things that people would uh, would think of as, um, uh, as, as um, I guess, improving accessibility for, for folks with specific disabilities. Yeah. And the, the interesting thing is it can happen to us any time. So yeah. here's me with my yeah. <laughs> hearing yeah. impairment. <laughs> uh, Nick, Nick, has, Nick has pointed out in the chat, gosh, wouldn't it be great if Crowdcast had a, a captioning feature built in? Uh -huh. And I mean, some tools do. Um, uh, do you yeah. know, uh, PowerPoint can run captioning, uh, you know, live um, in, in, in process, which is brilliant. Yeah. Um, uh, I can just take a look at the chat here. So Kim's throwing in, I think one idea with accommodation is that you bake it into the learning environment without having to go outside. It's ubiquitous and a natural part of the learning experience. I mean, that's kind of the, the metaphor of, of the ramp versus stairs and a ramp. You just, it's part of what everybody does um, and therefore it's, um, it's accessible to everybody, I guess. Eh? And Taryn is uh, talking about that too, the universal access approach. I mean, I think back in the day when we didn't think about accessibility or, or not enough of us were, it'd be like, oh, we need to allow for the audio not to play because they might have a noisy office, you know, yeah. <laughs> which, uh, but in the reality, adding all those different things in can have an impact or you talked about uh, dyslexia and those, and a lot of other cognitive disabilities. You don't even know that people have those um, issues or challenges, um, even if you've talked to them for a while. Um, but then also there's all sorts of folks that have English as a second language mm -hmm. or perhaps not the same education level. And, and those have a, a positive effect on everyone in that area too, which is a nice benefit. Um, and again, when people are thinking about accessibility, they don't always think about those items. Mm -hmm. Um, 
so let's let, let's uh, circle back, Susie. Um, I guess back to to the book itself. Um, tell us a little bit. Uh, um, I mean, you, you mentioned that you you'd had an interest um, in accessibility. Um, one of the things I'm always fascinated by is what what prompted you to move from being interested in to actually the the sheer level of effort in making a book. <laughs> So I think that the main thing for me was just uh, I was waiting for somebody else to write this book and um, nobody was. So, I, I, you know, all the greats, I was thinking, well, soon they'll they'll be writing this book. But it, it just came to the point where I thought I must be one of thousands of people who are struggling with this. And I really felt that um, partly because our industry, I feel really, is, is full of people who genuinely do care about that, you know, about making learning, uh, you know, appropriate so that everybody can get the best out of it. And I really felt that there was, you know, all of the instructional designers that I was talking to had a similar attitude to me. You know, they were saying, well, we, we should be making this accessible. But when we, when we come to do it, it's simply so difficult. We're looking at standards which are, um, you know, they don't seem to be um, written for us. They're written for web developers and, mm. you know, whenever we try it's just so difficult that, that that people were giving up and I was thinking you know I did spend a long time myself trying to, to to get to grips with the web content accessibility guidelines and Paul I think we had that discussion didn't we about just simply how difficult it was to try and apply them to learning and to understand them and um, I, in the end I thought well I've just spent so long doing this anyway <laughs> why not share this with people and I think that the, one of the things that I found quite difficult when I started writing the book was just this idea that you, you kind of set yourself up as an expert but that you know you think well it is that kind of imposter syndrome who am I to be writing yeah. this book but I suppose in the end it was I just felt it's better for somebody to write it and to put it out there and I'm sure that people will disagree with some of the things that that I've written and some of the interpretations that I've made of the web content accessibility guidelines but I, in the end I just felt this is just so important that if I put it out there and people disagree with me that that that's great in a way because at least then it's a conversation at least it's something that you know we can have that discussion as an industry and we can say well actually no our interpretation as an industry of this particular standard is that it, it means that that that's ultimately what I hope will happen from it and as I say I, I, it really isn't perfect it's you know I think if you work with web content accessibility guidelines you you, you find out quite soon that they you know, even you don't have to be an instructional designer. I think even um, web developers um, find that they are open to interpretation. So I think once you, I, I think once I understood that that, that that actually they was doing having the same issues that I was, I just felt well. As I say, it's just something that that really needs to, to somebody to do. So um, yes, I just thought well, I might as well do it because um, you know I've already done a lot of the work and, and <laughs> nobody else was. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was, when you first connect or we first connected, I was so pleased that you were having a focus on instructional design because as I wrote about it and learned myself, there are some great courses out there even. There's uh, several pretty good books out there. Some of the ones you knew too, you had read there, but yeah. again, they are a more general focus on accessibility and, and web design, which of course, e-learning is a subset of that. Um, you know, and as you talk to e-learning professionals and uh, the tools have gotten a lot better, which is is very uh, awesome in terms of that. But at the end of the day, sometimes people think if, oh, I just turn on the button, right? Or I run the checker. <laughs> and as you learn, it's it's kind of like, oh, I just push the cool graphics button and then all of a sudden I have a beautiful design. It's more than just checking the box in a lot of cases. It is design. I was curious as to some of the things that you looked to kind of add to the story or add to the information that were specifically um, in the instructional design and development world of e-learning that either helped make it more understandable if I was as opposed to people coming from a web design development or the books that focus on that. Obviously, the core topics at the top level are the same, but how you break them down can be uh, quite a bit different. Definitely. So I think, yeah, I think that the main thing for me was I suppose being an instructional designer myself was was that was always what was guiding me it was what what do I need you know if I if, you know if I was starting from scratch what would I need to have if I started and and that basically was what the book the book was so I think that the main thing for me was 
as I, I, I looked at as many different tools as I could because I wanted there to be, you know, it's quite difficult you because you tend to, I think quite often as an instructional designer, you tend to focus on, on one or two tools that you know very well. And what I wanted to do in the book is, is just really, you know, have a, a broad brush approach and have as many different tools as I could, even though, you know, they haven't gone into a lot of detail because I think it shows that, there are so many tools that that are doing things, you know, not, but we talked, Paul, didn't we, that, you know, that, that tools are getting much better. Mm -hmm. But I think what I wanted to show was that there is actually really good practice out there. And if I could show how different tools were applying those principles, I think that was that was a, a huge starting point for me. And then I think another thing that I felt was really important with the book was that kind of background knowledge of um, understanding things like assistive technology and I think, you know, and the, one of the reasons that I put the, for example, the, the, the learner case studies in there was because I felt I hadn't really had a great deal of experience of, of learners actually struggling with the, the content that I created. So I really wanted there to be a focus on, on that people side of things so that we, you know, so that, you know, even if you haven't had any experience of someone with a disability um, using your learning or, or, or trying to learn from your resource, then the idea that actually some of the things that you do can create barriers and the types of things that that, that can that can do to your learner was was a real key thing for me and as i say coming back to that one of the things that was really important was that assistive technology because i don't think that it's possible really to understand you know to really understand why you're doing things unless you have a pretty good idea of the assistive technology that people will use so for example you know to understand why you have to put the reading order in the right order you don't really understand you know, it's difficult to get to sort of get your head around that unless you actually understand how a screen reader works. And then, you know, a screen magnifier, for example, what you would need to do to your learning for someone who's really looking at a very small portion of, of the screen at a time. So um, I think for me, those those were the key things that I, I felt was were really important. So it was a kind of background and it was then being able to apply it to a, a whole range of tools. So not thinking, well, OK, I don't have the manual which shows me how to use my tool to make this accessible. The next best, best thing is to is to have something that, that that shows me the principles, and then I can see how the, how I can apply the principles, or how, or me, how maybe another tool is doing it, and then um, that I think for me is is a real help just to get that kind of, I suppose the context of what you're doing and um, before you start because I think that's the thing about you know it, I know we do focus a lot on the web content accessibility guidelines because you know that they're, they're quite often the the legal compliance that we're aiming for, but you know, even if you're not trying to to meet every one of those requirements, I think it's just getting that that understanding and the context before you start, not when you've kind of finished and then you're trying to shoehorn it in at the end. So it was kind of like that. Those were the key things I think that I wanted to to, to include in the book. Yeah, I think that that uh, and there are some things in the chat too talking about is it you know a checklist or a continuum and. And I think you've said that to me, and I, I found that too. It's really a, a continuum. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, people are brand new. Can I just, like I said, turn on those options on and off? Or how come the uh, tool doesn't have a step by step on how I make it accessible and turn it on after the fact? It's kind of like uh, I liken it to if you're familiar with graphic design or you're familiar with instructional design, you don't just go ahead and create content or whatever and apply it after the fact you need to be thinking about those things as you're developing and going through and you can make something that's instructionally sound or you can make it instructionally awesome <laughs> and you know both can be there and both are a step above not doing anything um, but it's not something that is quote unquote done um, and of course the standards obviously continue to evolve it does the technology um, and, and that's another challenge too. I found is mm. just like uh, playing around with technology. And if it's a new technology, you know, part of it's struggling with the new technology. If you go to use accessibility technology, you've never used it before. Part of your struggle is just learning that tool and then learning how it's done. Um, just seeing someone else use different technologies and having that experience combined can really see where people can go and then how whatever you're doing can make an impact and even something that you're like, oh, that's not that big a deal because you're so slow through it. But those other people are using the super speed and then that <laughs> thing really just slows them down and puts them dead in their tracks. It's like trying to stop a train um, and you do. Um, those are some things that you just don't experience until, like you said, you 
um, try it out yourself and get a chance to work with people in that um, situation. Mm -hmm. And again, the situations do vary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the whole idea of, of thinking about this as part of your, you know, getting started, even as part of your instructional design phase, um, some of the earliest projects that, that where we came across having to, you know, make sure that there was uh, something accessible and, and the default was to just make a PDF of all the content and provide yeah. that, you know, so that somebody could take it, you know, in that format as a, as a, as an alternative and uh, boy, what a, <laughs> In hindsight, I, what, a, what a disappointing thing that would that was to do. Well, think about if you were able-bodied and uh, or I like the TB, temporary able-bodied. We're all temporary able-bodied, which is true. And it's like, okay, that's the version you get. Are you satisfied with that version? <laughs> and no. <laughs> um, I mean, let's face it, there are good books out there. <laughs> so they definitely can be learning resources, but take advantage of the technology. And I, and I think that's also um, one of the reasons that, that, that accessible e-learning has a bad name, because I think this this idea that um, we have to, you know, that, that accessible, accessible learning cannot be interactive, it can't be engaging. I think that quite often stems from the fact that, you know, our mindset before was, OK, if it's accessible, we just produce the PDF. We don't have to worry about, you know, you know, the learning experience. We literally just have to give a text version of that. And I think. I think that's one of the the the, the, um, the areas where an industry. I think we we need to look beyond. I'll just check in, Paul. Or um, I, yep. I have, I, I'm having yeah. Freeze you, up, yeah. Susan, you seem to have uh, you seem to have been frozen up a bit on us here. Uh, we'll just give it a heartbeat, see if your video feed comes back uh, for us. Uh, I think one of the since we're experiencing yeah. a little technology, I think one of the things. Uh, Susie's book was uh, really great at, and also folks that are getting into it are experiencing is that the uh, technology, while fortunately has gotten a lot better, especially in the last couple of years to support um, all sorts of ways of interacting with content, it's uh, there is still a lot of variance. It uh, reminds me, again, I'm dating myself, but reminds me of the early web days although they lasted for a, a painfully long time where the browsers had all sorts of different interpretations, how things would work and different things played different ways. And in some cases that's uh, true with accessibility and some of the technologies there too. Um, you know, you, uh, and so it's also good, you know, to know your audience and, and which um, tools that uh the tech team or whoever is supporting is supporting those so you can make sure that those are the ones you test and 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 work with um hopefully in another few years uh that will be a moot point too just like uh finally browsers are almost in parity too um even though today <laughs> that's still not 100 percent true um, i don't think that'll ever leave us which is uh both uh good and bad uh, with that I'm just taking a second here, gang, to find Susie one more time and re-invite her back on screen. Um, I'm probably yeah, one scrolling of the, way too fast through the, uh, the list of folks. And one of the things I loved about you know this book, and I haven't got through it all myself yet, but uh, I just I just did get it recently while I was on vacation, of course. <laughs> but um, as I said to Susie there, th there aren't any books out there. I mean, I looked uh, far and wide trying to find another um, book that actually spoke specifically to e-learning and the technologies. And, and, and even if it didn't speak to the tool, which I, I like. Uh, and Susie, maybe now that you're you're back with us there. Um, stole some bandwidth from the rest of the house uh, that's a problem with everything everyone who at home is stealing all the bandwidth but um it's because i'm on my laptop not my desktop so it's an absolute <laughs> disaster i'm so sorry the unmitigated disaster is all i can no say no worries you know it, the, one of the things um and we started in our, our beginning of our conversation about empathy but uh 
all of us having these temporary working conditions for the last year and change um, and all the technical glitches that that uh, that, that can happen, et cetera. Um, I think the world recognizes the authenticity of, of, our, our, of our experiences. <laughs> That's with very, technology, very kind of you to say. Thank so, you. Uh, lots of patience around that. I, I, I won't mention the number of times I've had problems, uh, et cetera. So anyway, very cool. Um, I was going to say this, there, let, me, let me let me just say, Susan, there was a there was a question about the book itself, and a couple of yeah. people have asked. So before we forget, if you've got a, a copy, say I don't know, uh, a, a link to it uh, on the publisher's page or whatever, let's throw that in. Yeah. Um, just to see, just to make sure that we've got that for folks who are asking at the current time. So. And yeah. while I paste that in there, let me throw out a question to you. You can give some thought in the background. Um, so one of the things I ran into in reading books and courses is they, they did give some good practical and, hey, here's how you might test something. Again, it was focused on web development there. Um, of course, that's part of your subtitle, A Practical Guide to Applying Best Practices. I was wondering if you could share some of the things that um, you tried to put into the book that would really help people out in terms of the practical application of some of those different principles and I'm thinking in from not only developing but probably testing and validating because sometimes you put something in there and you're like did I do it right I don't know <laughs> so yeah I think one of the one of the key things for me was um wanting to um put a, a what I call a contextual framework to the whole of of the web content accessibility guidelines so uh, I kind of built uh, part of the book around um, what I call the, the e-learning accessibility framework. And it just um, looks at it from the point of view of, you know, it, if you're coming at this from, as an instructional designer, what do you need to know at, at certain stages of the project? Bear in mind that I know everybody sort of, you know, they, they do things differently, they have different tools, but a kind of a, a core framework that you can use. So, um, and I felt that was really, really important to really start breaking it down so that you could start applying it. So it just starts, for example, with what you need to do when you're setting up the project, what things do you need to bear in mind and also it um it then breaks it down into sort of contextual steps so what would you need to do for example when you what everything that you need to know when you are adding images everything you need to know if you're putting um text in there for example what do you need to know when you're looking at quizzes and assessments and then sort of moving on to sort of your interactivity so i, I think that was that that was the key thing for me was just trying to make it um, a framework that you could apply step by step and also by doing that it also allows you to then um, it breaks it down and it allows you to um, to, to dive in where you need to so if even if you know you suddenly become are looking at it. Um, Liz has been able to find a, a link to toss into the chat there for uh, for, for the uh, URL, etc., for the book, which is brilliant. Um, and Susie, your video was coming in and out again uh, there as well. Um, David's asking in the chat um, if, if if you cover in the book, and it's, I think it's partly what uh, Paul was also speaking to as well. You know, tech recommendations for you know QA testing, uh, things like browsers or or different screen readers that 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 we should be aware of those sorts of things. Um, let's just see. Oh. I don't think it. She didn't like that question. <laughs> 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 That's how I feel when I get a hard question. Sometimes I just want to disconnect. <laughs> no. Yeah, can you ask me that question again, please? For, for sure. Yep. Yeah. So David in the question panel is asking yeah. if, if in the book you're also covering tech, uh, you know, recommendations for QA testing. Um, he's suggesting, for instance, JAWS or, or, or recommended browsers, those sorts of things. Yeah. So what I what I did in the book was to try and sort of come away a little bit from this idea that accessibility is something that only accessibility experts can do so i um 
I, I sort of broke it down into when you're doing your testing, things that you can do easily on your own. So, for example, you know, even without any um, assistive technology, for example, you can test, test, for example, that you can with a browser, you can test that you can um, zoom into your text to 200 percent. For example, you can use a keyboard to make sure everything's keyboard accessible. Then you get the next step, which is um, is sort of things that you can do with some um you know with with kind of tools which are, are easy for everyone to use for example like contrast checkers and changing things to grayscale for example to make sure that you're not making um all of your um any of your um, instructions dependent on color alone things like that and then the next stage i i kind of call it testing with uh, with tools or with more you know usually assistive technology and that is where your screen a reader kind of testing comes in so although the, the screen reader testing is a really interesting one because although you can test basic things with a screen reader i found certainly in the last year working with the, with a screen reader tester who who uses jaws um daily um it, that's a different experience from what we tend to do as very basic testing. And the interesting thing for me is that actually sometimes, as I say, you could do things like testing your alt text, testing things like your, your reading order is correct, things like that. But when you see a, a screen reader user who's an experienced screen reader user, they will sometimes look at your content and things that you might have been agonizing over for hours thinking, I, I don't know why this is working like this. They will say, well, oh, that's just an anomaly of the screen reader. So it, it's actually working. You know, when you get to that level of working with assistive technology, if you can, I think that's where it's hugely beneficial to work with someone who has got a lived experience of a disability and, and is, a, is an experienced user. And then you've got yet another layer, which is your sort of real coding. And if you're going into that, so some of the web content accessibility guidelines are, um, they, they are based around coding. So that again is where accessibility experts are, are very useful because, you know, some, for example, you know, most of us don't know, you know, enough about accessibility coding to know whether something is compliant or not. But you can also obviously go to the tool and hopefully the tool will give you, um, uh, you know, a, a, a conformance report or a voluntary a VPAT, voluntary product accessibility test, which will, will tell you that information. If it doesn't, that's usually where I would say, well, you know, an accessibility tester who, who knows about the coding is, is you know, uh, is kind of essential. But there's certainly a huge amount that you can do when it comes to testing. And when it comes to um, specific tools, for example, um, you said that the screen readers, um, I think, you know, that the, the most popular ones are, are you know, the, the third party ones to, uh, are tend to be JAWS and NVDA in particular, because NVDA is, is open source and free. And then you also have the um, in, inbuilt ones, for example, VoiceOver for example so yeah i think there's there's certainly a huge amount that you can do when you can test you test yourself but you know it, it does get to the point where i think you working with accessibility experts is is certainly very valuable mm -hmm. and when when you were talking about the, the kind of process I, th I agree with you paul it's that in my in my framework it's a circular framework so it's just reminding you that you know once you've created those when it comes to testing sorry, when it comes to, you know, updating, it needs to go through the circle again, really, that, that you're double checking that everything is still compliant or is still accessible for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like your um, comment about the, the testing and the levels. It's something that is kind of involved or evolved from my thinking, too, is that there are a lot of, no pun intended, accessible uh, tools out there that are more accessible to everyone every day that you can kind of do that first level of testing and make a really big impact without having to, oh, I need to get into using JAWS. And um, not that that's a bad thing there, but you can really go ahead and test some of those different items. And one of the other things I just, I saw in the chat and I think is unique about your book, so I wanted to just comment on it is that I think in your book, you did try to, of course, tools are evolving all the time, but you did try mm -hmm. to uh, speak to some different tools like Storyline, Captivate, Domino, um, specifically about those, because none of the books and none of the guides talk about any of that. Um, you want to share a little bit? Yeah, so I, I think for me, that was, again, it, it was difficult not to try. And well, I suppose that was one of the stumbling blocks to, at the beginning, thinking, um, I need to, to write something that helps everybody with their particular tool. 
and it just you know that just isn't possible and as you were saying um it, it's also the tools are up being updated all the time you know so it's impossible to to write the manual of how to how to actually use your tool to, to make something accessible so i think my approach really was to um just to look at that best practice so if any tools were achieving some of the, the standards then to, to put that into the instructions but also there's a section at the beginning of the book where I focus on the best practice and obviously um, your tool is, is one of those where you're just looking at some of the really good things that tools are doing and hopefully by sharing that it, it's giving other people an opportunity that you know other, other tool providers to, to, to see what's good practice and what what actually that they can do as well so you know one of the things I, I love about about your tool is is the way that accessibility is just part of the process and it isn't something that feels like a chore or something that's bolted on at the end it just is part of the workflow so that's you know great and also things like um things like accessibility checkers that that make your life easier you know really good instructions on how to use the tool so um you know a lot of people aren't aware that there are these guidelines which are are, are around um called atag to, to help you to help authoring tool providers to make their tool accessible and so one of the things that they say is that the authoring tool provider should a make their that the authoring tool itself accessible that they should make it um easier for people to 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 make so it's possible for people to make the, the output accessible, but also that they should give guidance. So if a tool can give you guidance on how to do that, then then I think that's that's a, a fantastic best practice that, that hopefully is, is moving forward. And if you can bury that or you can, uh, you know, if that's in the actual workflow, so you're not having to go and look at the book or not having to go and look somewhere else, that is the ideal situation. So that, that there's plenty of things it, it's kind of it isn't perfect but it's it's you know the sort of the best that you can do the best that i could do anyway of, of trying to make sure that we were looking at, at various different tools and, and not not excluding um you know anybody who was using a particular tool mm -hmm. it's it's um it is in, in, from one perspective it's a very technical topic especially when we're thinking about web stuff and so many of us in in our roles we have uh, we might know a tool but we don't know you know the web world for instance at that level of depth so it can be a very daunting thing to start thinking about um and we may even struggle just with with the culture of the organization around us which may or may not put a priority um you know on on these sorts of things as i mentioned you know we've seen a transition where we do find more and more um non-governmental uh uh companies you know are, are making this a, a focal point um, which is a, a brilliant thing but um for many people it's still a Oh, I guess we have to do this, or or etc. So, there's the there's the there's the technical knowledge, the 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 you know that that level of our own competency, but there's also the the um, the cultural change that that needs to take place as well within um, and yeah, trying to explain to your boss why we're going to add X amount of time to the development of something because we need to do some new things, etc. Um, did you have any strategies within the book for for helping people uh, be able to address that within their own organization? And kind of adding to that um, is, you know, people talked about adding it after the fact and then having it as part of your workflow. And then, of course, people are to the point of, hey, this is going to add in so much more time and effort. Um, how strategies, but then how, what's the reality? Of course, there's always a learning curve, anything new. But once you've learned it, the actual applying it, what's tell, tell us a little bit more about that and that strategy, too. So yeah, I think there's there's lots of things that you can do to to make sure that accessibility is it, 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 you know is isn't seen as something that that's additional. And I think that that for me is kind of the vision of of where it would be great to become as an industry where accessibility just becomes the default. You know, we don't we don't even think about it. And um, I did see something um, recently on on social media, which is kind of a light bulb moment for me. Was that uh, it's and it said something like accessibility doesn't take more time you were just cutting corners before the work <laughs> wasn't complete and I thought for me that really summed it up you know you know and that's where I think that the change of the mindset I know that's quite a radical looking at it but I think in an ideal world that's where we need to be accessibility is just how it should be but, but there are things that you can do to to um you know to embed it in the you know to to make it easier in in the organization things like you know um 
have, making sure it's 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 at the beginning of a project that accessibility is considered that it's not shoehorned in at the end because then obviously it, it really does you know that the cost and the time really do increase considerably and i think you know you can have things yeah the, the key that, that that you were talking about there was like getting your explaining it to your manager getting leadership on board i think is absolutely crucial so that you know that everybody has, has a different a different mindset and it's not like when you're certainly the situation that i've been in the past is that you know uh, managers quite often think well make something accessible off you go go and do that you know it, it won't take very long it's kind of making sure that every yes tick the box so it's making sure that that you know that that all levels are aware but it's things like also um you know having things like have people champions who are across the organization etc so that it is that kind of idea of yeah i agree with you so it is a cultural change and mm -hmm. then that makes our jobs a, a jobs uh, you know a, as instructional designers so much easier if it's you know if if the whole organization is behind accessibility and, and you're not the only person just saying oh actually this is we need to put captions on this and we need to be doing this so yeah i think it's it's we, we have got a way to go but i think this is a, is a we're at a great point now and i think the i certainly see that there's traction and people are becoming more aware so i think if we can have the that the, the key thing then is getting the leadership of our industry involved i think in getting them on board i think that would be you know hugely significant for sure. And I think the fact that we now have a book that we can <laughs> show as, a, as an outside level of, of authority and influence, <laughs> it, it sounds like a small thing, but until some of these things, you know, reach certain stages, it becomes um, harder. It, it's, it remains hard to sometimes convince people up the chain, etc. Susie, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to play the thank music. You. And we'll, we'll get ourselves rolled out, but make sure you toss in your contact info here um, as, well. we, uh, as we uh, enter, send ourselves along. I'd just like to apologize again for my uh, technical uh, issues. No, it's all good. It's all good. Everything <laughs> traveled all the way across the pond to connect. So <laughs> normally with no problem. <laughs> and uh, Thank you. just before I forget, I've got a little bit of housekeeping here too. Um, for those of, uh, of you who haven't yet, make sure you guys connect with us in the LinkedIn group. We have a LinkedIn group where we follow up on a lot of these topics. Um, join us there to keep the conversation going on this front. Ask more questions. Yeah. yeah. Gang, um, thanks so much to everybody for joining us. The chat, as always, has been fabulous. And the questions were great, too. We have such a great uh, gang of folks who join us uh, every week here. Um, and we hope you join us again next week, guys. Have a great time. And in the meantime, keep dancing until, uh, until next Wednesday. Thanks for having me. Thank you. <laughs> Big finish. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your Cheers. week, and we'll catch you guys next time. <laughs>